All right, guys, welcome back to Entrepreneur Hour podcast and Entrepreneur Hour TV, where we create superhuman entrepreneurs. I've got a guest today. We're going to talk about something I don't think we've talked about on the show before. Uh, we're going to talk about this theory of mind, mentalizing, and kind of becoming a better salesperson. So we're going to talk about mental blocks. We're also going to talk about kind of the science behind making sales and, and what's going on at maybe a, a neuroscience level, right, in terms of your, your, your own brain. Uh, and how you can enhance your own abilities as a salesperson. Maybe we'll debunk some myths. I don't know. We're going to see where things go. But joining me today is Mr. Nicholas Vandenberg. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. Thanks for having me. I meant to tell you, man, I dig this whole backdrop you got going on with the the, the plants. Where are you right now? Uh, I'm uh, at the WeWork office. So uh, our, okay, company, okay. our company is actually uh, 100% distributed. We have 42 uh, employees in 36 cities. Okay. And we're all in different we work. But the funny thing is that uh, once you get used to it, you can uh, notice it's we work. They have a certain style. So that's ah, like, okay, yeah. okay, okay. I, I kind of do see that a little bit now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sweet, man. Awesome. So we, we always start out, we're going to jump, like I mentioned to the audience, we're going to talk about a lot of different things as it relates to enhancing their own sales abilities. I know you do a lot with training people how to create better sales reps, but it's just sales in general. So we're going to talk right. a lot about that. But before we get into that, before we get into that, let's talk about you. Um, give us a little bit of background about you, what you do, what led you to doing what you do, uh, and I'll let you kind of take it from there. Sure. So uh, as you can tell, um, I'm originally French. Uh, people, people, I didn't pick up on that at all, good. man. No. <laughs> <laughs> it just stayed with me. But I came, I came here a long time ago. I came in in the '90s. Uh, I went to Stanford Business School. And uh, I had planned to travel around the world, and uh, about two weeks into it, uh, one of my classmates, uh, Steve Jefferson, invited Steve Jobs mm. to the campus. And mm -hmm. Steve, at the time, uh, was running Next, which was going next to nowhere. <laughs> uh, so he was very humble. He sat on the floor. He started telling us the story of what he was up to, and. When I listened to him, I thought, wow, this is amazing. That's what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be a tech entrepreneur and, and do cool stuff. So that hijacked my plans to travel around the world. I stayed in Silicon Valley. And ever since I've been a tech entrepreneur, I've done several companies with several exits. And that encounter with Steve Jobs actually uh, is, is a nice segue into the, the topic we want to discuss today, uh, mentalizing, uh, because it's you know, later um, he sold next to Apple and then became to be uh, this uh, superhero that uh, right. we've known. And there was always something that I found strange is that uh, people would say, oh yeah, Steve Jobs is the best, best salesperson in the world. Interesting. You can say anything. And, and, uh, and then everybody says, oh, the important thing with sales is empathy. You have to have empathy. And I listened to the guy and I read more about him and I found no empathy in Steve Jobs, right? I mean, he, you know, he, 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 he never, he didn't even recognize his daughter, right? Yeah, he yeah. He has a daughter, then, then he would insult his employees and think that's not an empathy guy. And so that was something I didn't quite reconcile, that you need empathy and the best salesperson in the world had no empathy. So it's like saying uh, you'd have to be told to be uh, the best in basketball, but the best uh, basketball player is, is a 5'2", you know? Yeah. Um, so there was something not quite right. That's when uh, uh, got me super excited when I came across an article in uh, the uh, neuro neuroeconomics uh, journal. So it's, uh, it's uh, this big book. Uh, every five years they publish some of the latest discoveries in neuroscience mm -hmm. and um, and uh, I ran into this paper I was completely fascinated they said uh, we've uh, discovered that uh, there's a different capability in human beings that is a lot like empathy but it's not empathy they call it theory of mind or mentalizing and mm -hmm. it's um, the ability to understand and read the motivations of other people without being affected by them. So empathy means you you have the uh, empathy, right? So you, have you, the, you feel, uh, the, yeah. yeah, that's right. You feel the same thing. If you see somebody sad, you feel sad. If you see somebody happy, you feel happy. You you uh, you have the same. It's like a contagion of, of, of feelings. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that happened in the mind and, and they're reasonably well 
explore the brain circuits that does empathy. But what's amazing is that they found that when they look at people who are really good at mentalizing, they found it's a different set of circuits in the brain. So it's actually back to what you were saying earlier, it's like the different part of the brain that does the job. So being uh, in sync with feelings, the empathy is, is one thing. Being able to read the motivations of the other is a different uh, set of circuits, it's a different capability. Mm. So that was like the bulb went up and said, well, I get it now. I, I see Steve Jobs, he, he, he doesn't get sad when you're sad, he doesn't give a shit, but, mm. uh, but he knows exactly uh, what's going to make you tick, right? He's going to know exactly, he can put a new store on Fifth Avenue and get people all excited because he mm. knows what's going to get them uh, excited, what's going to get them motivated to, to, to buy stuff. Wow. So that, that's, the, uh, that's the thing. And so once I saw that, I said, hey, I wonder uh, if I can observe that in my day-to-day -day, uh, job with my sales team. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it's been a mystery for a long time where you see sales people in all shapes and forms. You see some introvert, extrovert, uh, people who talk a lot, people who don't talk a lot, people who are very funny, people who are not all funny. Um, and, and yet, there's no correlation between one, one of these traits and the top performers. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, listen, like I do now, to hundreds of calls uh, from salespeople, there's one thing that they, all the top guys do really well is this mentalizing thing. Mm -hmm. they, they, they read their prospect. They, 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 they. I had one of uh, my top sales uh, person back in my first startup in San Francisco in the late 90s. She would ignore some accounts, and I said, "But you, you haven't followed up." Say, "No, no, it's not worth it," because she knew from from the initial call that it was not going to happen. That the person was, you know, they, there was not enough material from the uh, the prospect to get motivated to actually buy. Whereas, as soon as she could sense there was. Uh, through mentalizing, she could read that somebody had a real aspiration to change, then she could work that mm. prospect, like there's no tomorrow and close deals, like there's no tomorrow. So that, that's that been a very interesting uh, uh, new uh, finding in, in your sense. It's very recent, it was, uh, it was in less than 10 years ago that this paper came out. Okay, so I, I want to follow up on that. I want to give a, a quick piece of context. So we were talking before, Nicholas and I were talking before we hit record, and the study that he was referring to that I mentioned to him was, um, you have this pervasive idea, like we do as a society, that salespeople are the Hollywood image representation of you know, the Jerry Maguire, right? The guy that's like just witty and, and charming and handsome and all these various things. And the reality is, is what we found, and this was a, a neuromarketing company I was involved with, we used all of these layers of biometric tools, four different layers of biometric tools, so we could actually read stimuli uh, that would basically suggest to us uh, how somebody felt about something, uh, but the intensity of how they felt about it. And we could also measure their brainwave activity. And so what we discovered was kind of the opposite of what you would expect. The, the experienced, more successful salespeople um, actually, the regions of their brains that lit up were the ones that have to do with listening, not talking. The novice level, you know, salespeople, it was all the regions that involved uh, speaking, right? So they were, so, so, in, so in actuality, the witty, charming, talking all the time salesperson, as we found, would have actually been considered a novice level salesperson. I want to make sure we provide that context because you, you referenced it. Um, now to what I want to talk to you about as far as continuation. Um, so with what you found with mentalizing and you said it's recent within 10 years so did did somebody like a steve jobs did he just luck into it like how did he just in, yes. intuitively know yes. what he was doing and has the principle been around just hasn't had a label prior that, to that? That, that that's right exactly when you have a talent you you, you don't need to explain it you just practice yeah. it right it's like federer is probably the worst people to teach tennis because it's so easy for him right so uh it's the same thing with steve jobs I, uh, uh, I don't know. He just had, he just had it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He just got lucky. Okay. So for the rest of us that, that maybe, uh, and, and you know, you and I talked about it when we, we let out, we're, you know, we were talking about what we we're going to discuss in the show and so on and so forth. And we we're like, you know, I brought up something that a lot of people say, I'm just not good at sales. I, I'm, I'm, you know, they have this block mental block around it. 
Um, so maybe this gives them hope. Maybe this empowers them with something they can put in their toolkit that can help them with that sales approach. So thinking back to, you know, you talked about a sales rep that she just knew this is not an account worth pursuing. This one is, what were some of the things that you did uh, being demonstrative in terms of helping people understand how to do this mentalizing theory, right? Or this, this theory of mind. Um, are there some practical steps and applications that people can take and do so that they can develop this skill so they don't have to say, well, I just have it or I don't, right? And have a fixed mindset around that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a big change in, in, in uh, the recent years is that a lot of sales happen over uh, video conferencing. Mm. So all our sales at Chili Pepper are actually over video conferencing like we are right now. Um, right. And so the great thing about it is that you can record it. Yes. So you can go through the call afterwards and, and, and then look into what happened. So we practice, have a, per, a person 100% uh, uh, dedicated to uh, coaching and training, sales coaching and training. And we look at these calls and we practice this, this uh, capability, which is mentalizing. And very specifically, uh, the most important part of mentalizing is in the early part of the sales process in what's called uh, discovery. The discovery right. Of, right, right, right. It's when you're going to discover. Uh, so people look at discovery as in, uh, I'm going to ask a whole bunch of questions or, or what, what you have to, what's happening, you know, I think. But the discovery is twofold. It's, a, is it a context where objectively my product can add value? And B, I'm discovering the mentalizing piece. Mm. What, is, what is in this prospect really going to make, make that prospect move, right? What, what, what are the motivations in the prospect brain that are going to uh, move? Because um, we all have a million things to do right you are on trying to sell something that the person has, has a million of things to do and you want to get priority so you you know you know your product can add value to that company other products can add value to that company and you get to get that prospect to move that's where the mentalizing uh comes in but and so we we, we use that with, with, yeah, with videos but you can also uh, if you for, for uh, people who sell in person, if you, you have somebody come with you, you can have that person observe what you've done and, and debrief afterwards. It's a real practice to actually uh, to, to do this mentalizing thing. Okay, are these verbal or non-verbal cues? Or what exactly, so if you, were, if you were using mentalizing with me right now, right, you can see me, let's pretend this is the sales process. What are some of the things you're looking for that I'm demonstrating? Is it facial expression? Uh, is it the way that I'm sitting? Is it the way that I respond to things? Is it all of the above? Is it, you know, the tone in my voice? What are some things that you, you know, as someone who practices this this mentalizing, uh, what would you be looking for specifically in me? Yeah, I, exactly what you said, all of the above. Okay. You, you're looking for all cues and every cue is worth uh, picking up. Uh, but I'll gi give you an example. Uh, we always ask, our prospect to share their screen and show us how they do things right now, right? So say, oh, you came to us. So at Chili Pepper, we to make scheduling and, and inbound scheduling. People come and, and uh, instead of, uh, so it's for websites when people fill a form, um, instead of getting a thank you page, we automate, we in real time find the rep and, and book the meeting. So we ask our prospect, tell me how you do it right now. Okay, sure. Share your screen, share your screen and show us how you do it. Mm. And what we're going to pick up is some embarrassment. At some stage, they think the thing looks it looks bad, right? And, okay. um, and, and you see, and I teach my reps to look there. You see that point there? That's the embarrassment. If okay. the embarrassment, then you you know that they have material to work with, that they're not happy with their process, and you're going to be able to uh, pick up on that cue and say, look, and now let's look at how it could be for you, and you show them the, how the beautiful uh, right. future, future could be. So the answer, the answer to your question is, you're going to read the embarrassment in their voice, in what they say, in, in how they behave. You're going to be able to uh, read all the cues that are, that are important to understand um, the ground on which they're going to be motivated to move. I would say, and I'm glad you're kind of validating this theory that I have, because I have said one of the bigger 
benefits, I think, or advantages that I've picked up along the way in both sales and marketing is analyzing it and approaching it from a more of a psychological perspective. Because I think that too many of us, uh, and this kind of ties into what I was talking about before, people who just want to talk, 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 whatever, it's that our objective in the call is not to do what you just said. It's not to analyze, it's not to ask them questions, it's not to do any form of discovery, it's to, here's my script, right? Here are the, the features that I need to present to you, here are the benefits of what we offer, I gotta get all that in. So just shut up and let me do all the talking, and then you make it as, and it's the opposite, right? From what you're yeah, saying, it's the complete opposite. And here's the deal, I think, and maybe this is a way that people can kind of like mentally um, wrap their minds around like kind of a metaphor of what they should look like, um, but man, the, the, the best sales experiences that I've been a part of, we didn't sell. We, we helped guide them to the sale, right? We helped navigate them in their own, you know, psychological makeup, walk themselves to, you know, in their minds, that light bulb went off of, yes, I need this. Not anything we said. It's not some magical script, right? It's, it's allowing them to work their way through to arrive at the sale. Would you not agree that's kind of been your experience? Absolutely. Exactly. You're exactly right. Uh, the other extreme, the bad way to do it, we, we call it the talking brochure, right? Yeah. You're a talking brochure. You start listing all the features like a talking brochure. Yeah. It's the worst way to, it's the best way to lose a deal. Sure. <laughs> You know, yeah. at, the, at the end, you done a lot of confusion and, and uh, you've explained a lot of features. People say, oh, there's a lot of features and you haven't helped them at all. Uh, but what, 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 I, uh, what we teach at TV Piper, our salespeople is say, look, you find what it is that's going to move people. Mm. What is it they're motivated? That's mentalizing thing, right? And that's all you focus on. The so shorter, the better. You just yeah. achieve certainty that this, this is going to be resolved. And you don't need to talk about features. You don't need to talk about things. Just, this is what they want. This is what's going to move them. Just focus on it and, and, and take them to the place, the better place. That seems so much more. Okay, so if I present it, like if I, let's say I know nothing. Let's say I just arrived here in a spaceship from another planet, right? Okay. And you're explaining both of these dynamics to me, right? And I have a conceptual level idea of, you know, basic psychology. Let's say that I'm a sister planet and we kind of operate in the same ways, but I just don't know sales, right? Let's say we're in a, a utopia that doesn't require any term of monetary transactional, you know, interaction. So, and you're explaining okay. this to me. I would say not even close that the, the 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 way that you're doing it right with through mentalizing through reading them through through all that in comparison to the brochure approach the the jerry Maguire approach all day long it that just makes more sense to me right like in my rational objective thinking brain that makes more sense to me so so here's my question then this what we're talking about um like you said it's only been around for the theory of it, it's only been around for like 10 years and I don't think that many people, at least not in, in, I would say not the general consensus are people that are using these uh, foundations, right? That aren't using these principles. So how the heck did we get this so wrong for so many years? And we've built an entire industry, right? This, this idea of sales has really been built on the foundation of the brochure based approach. So was there a point in time where that was like we had not achieved a certain degree of intellect to understand that there was a better way to do this or why is it just now happening in the last 10 years and why has there been an entire foundation built on something else that's probably not as well definitely is not as effective yeah so there are two sides to the answer the first one is that um, there has been attempts to to get a better find a better way so mm. the, that talking brochure um, has been under attack uh, for quite a while now. You know, there's been thing called uh, spin selling, solution selling, yeah. challenge selling. So a lot of people say that's not right to just uh, talk and talk about You have to do it differently. So it's not the case that uh, if you had landed from your planet 10 years ago, you would have found only talking brochures. There were already yeah. efforts, efforts to do a better job. Mm. But the big difference is that uh, salespeople were in person. So they would go to their meeting, come back, and then you didn't know what had happened, right? So it was a black box. That time that they spent with the customer was a black box. So you don't know, you, you train them. That's why it was a famous uh, survey where people found that uh, salespeople get training and uh, 
three days later, they forgot 95% of what they were trained on. Yeah, right, they right. don't care. They're going to go back on their own to call customers. Nobody's going to watch them. And, uh, and they're going to, uh, the good ones will have good results and they won't share the secrets. That's another thing too. You very often hear people say, I'm not going to share my secrets. I want to be... Mm. So it, it, was, it was a black box and there were attempts to make it better, but it was a black box. Now two things have happened. One is, is there are more findings from uh, neuroscience that, that can explain the performance of top salespeople uh, mm-hmm. along with things of what you've done in your marketing and, and this article. Mm-hmm. And the second thing is that these uh, tele and video sales that are recorded have opened up the black box, right? All of a sudden, when somebody comes up for a meeting with a customer or prospect, I say, can you please play the recording? Mm. And you see everything, right? So all of a sudden you can really act on Analyze, it. Analyze, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, and say this is the wrong way to do it. It's, yeah. it's, it's opening up, uh, our sales opening up. Sales is behind in terms of uh, science and discipline. Hundred percent. Yeah, and and so um, I think now no, it's going to catch up. Um, you can ask. Uh, it is mentalizing is so critical. Why don't people talk about it? They say, well, because in uh, computer science, if some university comes up with a better way to do something is going to spread in the industry very quickly mm. because there are all these relays right they, they, are, they teach computer science in universities people go back to classes then they go to their work sales they barely any sales class anywhere right? it's, it's, it's not taught in college and uh, and there's there's no um uh, bridge between research and practice it's, it's it, research is actually the research I'm referring to is called neuroeconomics. It's a, it's a science of uh, decision making. Um, the sales community doesn't even think of it as, as, as relevant to them. <laughs> like that. Even though it, it, if you think of it, sales is about decision making. Mm. It's about leading somebody to make a decision and, and act on it, right? Um, that research on decision making seems like some abstract science that has nothing to do with that. So there, there, there is this missing uh, yeah. link between the science community and the practice community. Um, and again, the reason was that it used to be a black box and there was no easy way to transfer that knowledge. I think that's changed. Yeah. Well, you're proving, so I have a theory and, and I think you're proving it, but so much of, I mean, you've seen this explosion in specifically in information products, which is part of what I do, right? Online brand and selling information products. And there's this, explode, like it's doubled and tripled and then tripled again over the past five years. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's explosion. It's a multi hundred billion dollar industry at this point. Um, and one of the things I think that, that is, that is enticing about it is I can do it from wherever, right? Like I can, I can be at home, I can be in my pajamas and I can sell something you know whether it's specialized knowledge or whether it's i have these little you know trinkets that i make and i can sell these on etsy or i can sell on my own website or whatever the case may be and it's a very appealing option uh and specifically for females because females are starting businesses five times the rate of men right now which is uh, which is amazing um but one of the things i tell people is you can't skip the steps what am i mean what i mean by that is it's very difficult to go from i've never done anything in business or I've never done anything in this specific industry, probably both in some cases, um, and I wanna go directly to selling stuff on my website. And I think, maybe you'll agree with me, I'm assuming you will, one of the reasons that doesn't work as, as much as it may seem like it's a, a logical thing to do is you don't have this opportunity. One of the hardest things, I've been in both, I've been in the offline space and I've been in the online space, I've been in the small business space, I've been in the tech space, I've been all over, right? One of the biggest disadvantages specifically to the world we live in now, which is very much a digital world, is it's so hard. You have one chance with a sales page or with your marketing message to really captivate and grab somebody to move them enough to pull out their wallet amongst the 5,000 ads. I think the average, I think now is like 3,000 to 5,000 pieces of advertisement somebody sees in a single day. That's outrageous. What makes them compelled enough of all those thousands to buy your specific product at that specific moment? Your messaging has to be on point. Your psychology has to be on point. I think one of the issues, Nicholas, is people try to skip that step of doing what you're talking about, which is actually spend time face-to-face, rolling up their sleeves and doing that work, even if it's a basic iteration of what they've been doing, 
right? But I see so many people struggling to make sales and I often see those people being in the online business space. Is that something you've come across and seen? I see what you're saying. There's no question that uh, there are many, many, many more options now these days. Uh, I tell myself, the uh, team also, I said, uh, look, we don't lose to competitors. We lose to alternative projects. Mm -hmm. So it's not the product that's better than our product. It's just that they decide to work on something else that's completely, not completely unrelated, but, but different. So that that's a key thing. You need to get the, your prospects motivated to choose to work on the project relevant to your product. And that's very difficult. Just like you said, there's so many options. And you're absolutely right. The, the idea that uh, for a novice entrepreneur is to think, well, I'll just put my things online before we get it. Yeah. It doesn't happen that way, right? Mm -hmm. so you, you, you have to do that work to understand, do the research, go in person, uh, the first year, I did everything in person. Uh, I would go and meet people, understand their problem, uh, get on, on, on site with them, uh, that show me how they work. And you have to understand what they get under their skin, what they have in mind, how, what they feel, and then, mm. and then from there, you can get your product. I completely agree with you. You cannot just launch something with that uh, knowledge. Now, some people, if, if you've been... Uh, like, for example, the founder of eBay was in my uh, class at uh, Stanford Business School. Oh, that's awesome. Right? And, uh, and um, he was trading, uh, I can't remember the, the name of the, the, the little objects. He was used to trading these little objects. Um, and he, he was in this, in this community. So when he, he came up with the idea to do it online, he very much felt what the problem was, how people thought and, and what they needed yeah. and immediately came up with it, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, if you already know, like you said, if you're already in the industry, you understand the industry very well, then you're going to be able to come up with a solution that comes for right. uh, What you can't do is, is just improvise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about, you know, I, t I said before, like practical things people can do. So if they're in the online space, um, and they, and they want to start practicing, you know, some of these methodologies and stuff like that. Do you recommend they get a job in the industry or do you recommend they have, I said a basic iteration to maybe where they're selling, they go to a farmer's market, even let's say they are selling trinkets online. What are some basic steps they can do to kind of get this, even a conceptual level understanding of this practice, this modality? Yeah, there are two steps for an entrepreneur. The first step is the product market fit. And then the second step is scaling. Um, the first step in product market fit, uh, the most important thing is to actually go visit customers, see in, inside how they operate, what, what, because interviewing people is not reliable. They may say, oh, I have this problem, but then when yeah, you look sure. at it, they're actually not, not acting. So you have to go and observe uh, what they do, totally. how they do it, and, 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 and get on the skin. Then you can uh, come up with a solution that's going to uh, uh, meet their unmet goals. Then you need to scale, and scale is about uh, sales and marketing. So then that's the second piece, what we discussed uh, around uh, how to be very effective at sales. Mm -hmm. um, and that's this uh, concept of discovery and mentalizing, where you're going to be talking to a prospect. Now, you already know that your product works and your product is good for them and your product adds value mm -hmm. because you've done, you've done the first step very diligently of product market fit. So you're looking at uh, how, how am I going to get these people to prioritize projects on my product over the other ones. And mm -hmm. that's where the mentalizing come in. You have to understand where they could be motivated right? and read in their mind, through their mind, where they could be motivated. Like you said, you have to listen and, and, and look at the cues that tell you, this is important to me. This is uh, the thing that uh, matter to me and what, I will act on uh, because it matters to me. Okay, that makes total sense. And is there, um, I don't know if somebody's written a book on this, but is there something if people, so I, I make this mistake, right? We talked about we talked about Steve Jobs and I make this mistake. I grew up in a sales environment. Um, my father was a salesman and so I was just very fascinated with sales. And so um, I, I when I entered into my adult life and I was growing businesses and making multiple six figure sales and you know growing businesses and stuff like that, one of the things I didn't realize was how much of it uh, did come pretty naturally to me, right? There's other things that I really struggle with that I have to, to work on, but sales in particular has always come really natural to me. 
Um, and so some of these cues that you mentioned, like I know in my mind when you say that, I'm like, oh yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. But I know a lot of people they are like, okay, if he makes this face, what does this mean? If he sits down this way, what does that mean? If they look to the corner, what, like, should we make it that robotic and mechanical or is it a gut feeling, right? Like, should somebody say, I don't know, you know, the way they did this, I don't know if it was positive or negative, maybe it could be misinterpreted, right? But are there certain cues that are 100% proven to be, this is a good thing, this is a bad thing, right? I know in psychology, they say there are certain behaviors or certain ways that people do things, whether it's posture, so on and so forth, that indicate certain things. Is there a resource, if people are interested in this, and maybe they do struggle with sales, it's not natural, it doesn't come as natural for them, where they can go to maybe empower themselves with more of this information? So the answer is no, you cannot uh, teach it in a robotic fashion. It okay. doesn't work that way. Right. And, and I say that with confidence because it has been tried. Uh, <laughs> there, sure. there, there was the thing called uh, neuro-linguistic programming mm -hmm. uh, with all sorts of uh, hypotheses on how to sell. And it was like you said, they say, if they look the upper left, uh, then it means that they are thinking about the future. And so you need to spot that and, and go there. Therapists have been able to use that stuff because sure. they, they or they're on watching people, uh, salespeople, it doesn't work. You, you, you cannot, uh, all this thing, oh, if they say, uh, I see what you mean, then show them something. But if you see, I hear what you're saying, and then, then talk to them, you know, that, that, that kind of, of, of simplistic cue. Uh, no, that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but, but, and there's no question, like you said, that uh, <clears throat> some people are born with a talent around mentalizing. Next team jobs, yeah. they just get it. It just comes to them. So, but there is an in between. Uh, you can improve like everything. When you have a certain talent, uh, you can always improve by practicing it, by, by uh, uh, acknowledging the key aspects of it and practicing them. So it's mm -hmm. not going to be as robotic and say, uh, look at his eyes, uh, look at his hand, and that's what it means. But 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 you are going to be able to uh, to. Uh, improve by paying attention to something it's always yeah. a thing right? when you measure something and you pay attention you 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 uh, have a chance of improving things um the way we do it here as i said is is call review we look at calls we review the call we have, we have a theory of what it is uh, we're looking for which is this ability to read what is going to motivate the other person i i, I I call it finding some material to work with, right? You're looking for another person the material to work with to get them motivated. So we know that's what we're looking for. We're doing a discovery to find the emotional material to move people. And we look at the call and we can see if it was done or not. And you'd be amazed by the number of calls that say, so tell me what, what you're looking for, uh, I'm looking for, for a new solution from our website. Uh, ask someone, we have it, let me show you. Right? That's not the way to do it, right? Mm -hmm. You have to understand why you're looking for a solution. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And that's what we do is share your screen, show me what you do now. Oh, wow, what is it? that's really awful. Yeah, I can see you, you must be so frustrated. Yeah, well, now let's talk about how we're going to solve that frustration. Yeah. So, so um, it sounds like this genuine intrigue then that you really want to get to know what's going on in that person's life. You can't fake that. that yes. Well, you really want to know uh, what's motivating for, for sure, yeah. Sure, sure. Now, but... now um, it's a funny thing because you don't need to care about it beyond the fact that you're going to sell a product. No, right, right. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. right, right. You, don't you, don't need, have, I'm not, you don't have to become best friends, but you do have to. You, yeah. you don't need to have empathy. You don't need to say, shit, oh, I'm so sad, I'm so sad. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Because, <laughs> because you happen to be the doctor with the medicine. Right? Yeah. So yeah, we yeah, ask yeah. people, show me your inbound process. That's a good, I like that play. metaphor. I, I, I lose 70% uh, of my inbound. Well, we have the medicine. You got yeah, to, yeah. to uh, recover these things. So yeah, that's right. Okay, that, that that makes a lot of sense, and that's and that's where you you were you're talking about how Steve Jobs he didn't go there. He understood it, but he was diagnosing. I like that metaphor, diagnosing not to the point where you're going to send them a sympathy card because of all their struggles and challenges and with their website. <laughs> You, you, it's a great metaphor, diagnosing exactly. And, yeah. and, you, and you don't need to, actually it's probably better for doctors to not empathize, right? Give you the right medicine and be done with it, right? 
You know, one of the better, I'm actually, he's a, he's a friend of mine. He's a friend of the podcast. He's been on a couple of times and I'm actually going through and working with him right now. One of the things that, that he does, Ryan Levesque, um, with his ask theory is creates these, uh, quiz funnels, right? Where you send people through a quiz and you're diagnosed, he literally calls it diagnosing and you're, you're basically, you're basically having them identify with certain questions and certain things like that. And at the end, there's some kind of a, a result, right? Where you, say, this is what's going on. This is the problem, right? He calls it a bandaid. And then you're presenting your solution, which is your sales mechanism. So it, effectively, it makes a lot of sense with what you're saying, because I look at what he's done and what we're doing together. And I'm like, this is bananas how well this works, right? Because here's the, here's the thing. This is the important thing to remember for a lot of people. And I'm not trying to commandeer our, our conversation here, but what's the number one thing that people want to talk about? Me, myself, and I, that's right. it. That's the thing they're most fascinated in, right? And so if you can make it about them, I think you immediately grab their attention, right? And I think you can really feel like you have control over what's happening in that dynamic by just making it about them. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Quiz is a great way to, uh, to uh, um, get people to talk about themselves, their problem, and, 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 and what's important to them. For lower ticket items, yes. I think w with what you're talking about, selling high ticket, which I assume you, is what you guys are doing is selling high ticket. Uh, I would think there, that this this video conferencing, or at least, you know, at the very least, maybe even a personal sit down is maybe probably necessary even beyond that, right? That might be an entry point in the customer discovery process or customer journey. Um, but I would think that, you know, a high ticket item, like tens of thousands of dollars probably requires more than that. Yeah, yeah, that's why the salespeople exist. Yeah. No, for sure. Salespeople always have a job. That's for sure. Um, okay. So would you say, and have you seen this where, um, and I want to give, I want to leave people with some hope here, a little bit of, you know, maybe yeah. personal empowerment. Um, can you talk about maybe a story of someone that started with you, uh, that you train that just would maybe label themselves, not a good quote unquote, not a good salesperson that was able to utilize this mechanism and came out the other side and it was like, wow, I'm actually, you know, able to enhance or, or to grow upon this skill and become what I feel to be a good salesperson because of this. Well, uh, I'll say something positive is very often people are actually very good at it and, and uh, don't know because they, <laughs> they, they claim to hate sales. Uh, I think we discussed that uh, uh, earlier. Um, my my co-founder is my wife. She, she's in this category. Uh, she says I hate sales. I can't do sales. And whenever I put her on a sales call, she do it standing. Uh, <laughs> she she does have this ability to read people. So first of all, uh, you have to make sure you understand the difference between being good at it and and being comfortable with it. Yeah. A lot of people are uncomfortable, but yet they're very good. So that's a great in, point. In your audience of entrepreneurs, I can tell you a lot of people are much better than they think. That's awesome. They, they just they just feel uncomfortable about they think they're begging or something, but but uh, they have this negative image of sales. But they have the underlying talent. Now how to practice it, yes, we have a people, uh, we, we had got into the bad habit of uh, starting to pitch immediately, right? And uh, we bring them on board at Chili Pepper and say, this is not how you do it. You know, <laughs> you just, you can't go straight into uh, pitching. Yeah. Some of the people were also uh, uh, shy and, and felt um, uh, probably because of the, the image of a salesperson begging so they, they would not dare to ask a person to share the screen, for example. Right. So, uh, I have the, had, um, account executives come and, and, and do a very poor job of the discovery process and um, after practice and um, learning how to spend more time in the discovery, spend more time mentalizing, go from conversion rates around 6% to conversion rates uh, north of 30%. Wow. On the deal they talk to. I mean, every industry has their own conversion rates depending on your product, but sure. and it's going to be times five the improvement you get uh, from, from being becoming aware of, of that, the importance of that uh, step, uh, becoming aware of what needs to be done and then practicing doing it. Hmm. Very cool. Awesome. Um, I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit. I know you just mentioned Chili Piper. What exactly do you guys do there and where can people go to learn more about you and, and what the, the work you guys do involves? Yeah, so we, we started the company because I love sales, as you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> and I figured I'm going to build a tool to help salespeople cool. uh, do their job. And I started with scheduling because uh, booking meetings is the most important piece. And we started with uh, something that looked really 
absurd to me, it's the inbound process where currently sure. people come to a website, they're interested, it says request a demo or talk to sales, you fill a form, you click submit, and you get a thank you page, thank you, somebody's going to call you. And you're left wondering, well, who is going to call me and when? And company lose yeah. more than half their prospect to that. So that's what she yeah. solves. When you submit a form, we take the data from the form, we qualify the prospect and in real time we dial a rep and we dial back the prospect, we put them in touch immediately or we retrieve a calendar and we say, please find a time that works for you to get the demo and they book in real time. So we have um, a lot of great customers like uh, Intuit, Square uh, and hundreds more companies and all of them um, have found that their conversion rates typically double, right? So they stop losing uh, inbound leads. That's what we do with uh, Chili Piper. It's a play on word, Chili Piper and Piper as in pipeline. So Chili Piper, and you can find us at chilipiper.com. I love it, really cool. Now, who's a good fit for something like that? Is it is it big companies, the, like B2B, you mentioned? All B2B companies. Uh, all B2B. That are a form that want to get in touch. Like we said, it's important. Yeah, part of the process to uh, have a demo and a meeting, and everybody, uh, every com- B2B company booking demos and meeting. We also have B2C companies who want to book meetings with their customers. Yeah. So B2C is typically oh, right. typically done online, like e-commerce. Mm-hmm. But some, kind of, for example, the uh, film school in LA uh, use our software to book meeting with prospective students. Yeah. Uh, if you know the company Remote Here about traveling around the world they also book all their all their candidates through chili piper that's cool so anybody who wants to get in touch uh, have a reserve a time to book a meeting with a prospect use chili piper I, I don't know where you guys were five years ago but i was scaling a service-based business and this would have been the cure to a lot of my ailments having something like that in place because somebody would call a prospect and one of my sales reps would miss it because they're on the phone with somebody else they call them back, well now they're busy, then they call back, they're on the phone again, and it's just this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it, it, it I'm, I'm sure we lost a ton of prospects in the process of doing so, um, but I think more so, we were growing so fast, that, that was probably okay, right? Like it was like, oh my God, we can't take any more business anyways right now with the current bandwidth we have. But the biggest thing was just how much manpower was exhausted in that back and forth you know, limbo of you know, playing telephone tag. Yeah, that makes no sense. That's why we uh, we, we automate that process and, and, and it makes a world of difference. Yeah, that's beautiful. Now we, we um, So that's been very successful. We run uh, uh, super fast and now we're about to launch uh, an inbox. So we're taking on Outlook and, and Gmail uh, and our inbox is going to be designed for salespeople. And um, the innovation we're doing is to make it uh, collaborative so if you have your sales team work on a deal you'd be able to access every email that's mm. that's on that deal and, and super helpful comment around it right say hey uh, why do you do that why don't you do that and, and so on so we, how we much, uh, yeah it's how much time is wasted forwarding emails hey can you just forward me that email you sent before well, yeah oh so much time is wasted yes exactly right so we we going to launch that in the next couple of months Awesome. Cool, man. All right. Make sure to check that out, guys. I'm going to drop that link below. Uh, it's chilipiper.com. Yeah. Chilipiper.com. All right, Nicholas, I appreciate you, my friend. This was enjoyable. I think this is really powerful stuff. And I think uh, my audience got a lot of it. I myself got a lot of it as well. So thank you for that. My pleasure. All right, buddy. Take care, man. Bye. Bye.